Good morning. Good morning. We want to take a moment to welcome back Megan. It's great to have you with us again. And she's not alone, not only with her mother, but Sabine is here at God's house for the first time. And so if you hear her making a few amens, you're welcome to join in. But uh, your service is printed out for you. Today we're going to ask and answer a simple question during the sermon. What does our faith actually need to survive? When we get down to brass tacks, when everything else is swept away, when all we have left to is to hold on to Christ, is that enough for our faith to survive? So please rise as we begin our worship. Let us call on the name of the Lord, our God. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I invite you to kneel if you're able. For our failure to fear, love, and trust you above all else. Forgive us, O Lord. For our misuse of your holy name. Forgive us, O Lord. For our inattentiveness to your word. Forgive us, O Lord. For our unwillingness to obey and honor those in positions of authority over us. For jealousies that divide our families, workplaces, and communities. Forgive us, O Lord. For our sexual impurity. Forgive us, O Lord. For wanting what does not belong to us. Forgive us, O Lord. For hurtful and harmful words. Forgive us, O Lord. For our lack of godly contentment. Forgive us, O Lord. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for His sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and redeemed servant of Christ, and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to show mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith, to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from Exodus. God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, either in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth below, and that is in the water underneath the earth, nor you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien residents in your towns, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male, or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the first Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God. And the, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than any human strength. The word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel according to John, the second chapter. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it, raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Well, to be honest, it was a long week for me last week. Yesterday was another long day at the end of a long week. I think by the time I got done working, we had made a late afternoon shut-in visit. It might have been 5 o'clock or so before I got home. So last evening after supper, all I had enough energy to do was to sit in front of the booth to, you know, the television. And we were watching a TV program by the name of Man vs. Food. And this particular episode was set in Pittsburgh. Well, that brought back some uh, recent memories because you see last August we took a brief four-day trip to Pittsburgh and the surrounding area. And the program last night, Man vs. Food, they featured a most unusual restaurant. A restaurant that was located, believe it or not, in a beautiful old church set in the Polish hill portion of Pittsburgh. It had been it had been a magnificent Polish Catholic church, but now it was being used as a restaurant. But not just a restaurant, it's known, its title is the Old Church Brewery. And it still had stained glass windows, and it had some pews. And the brewery, where was it located now in this repurposed building? It was located where the altar had been. It was located where the chancel was typically found. And then the host of the program, then he said what I think is close to sacrilegious words. In the eighth day, man created fear. So what do you think about that? What do you think about that? I can't help but wonder, what did those former parishioners feel as they drove by their church, which was now a brewery, and did any of them go inside to see the changes that had been made? I can only imagine they must have been devastated. They had to be heartbroken at what had happened to their beloved church. Well, what about us gathered here this morning? And what about you worshiping from home? Could our faith, can our faith survive the loss of this building? if it comes to that. Well, I go back in memory lane. I guess that's a sign of me getting older. I spend more and more of my time traveling down memory lane. And oh, how I love this room we're gathered in this morning. But do you know something, a little secret, a confession I want to make? When I first arrived here now, going on almost 18 years ago, this sanctuary, It wasn't all that impressive. Maybe you've been in a grand cathedral or the basilica, and what's our tiny little sanctuary? 
compared to such magnificence. But as time has gone on, I've come to love, I've come to love this room, this holy place, this sacred space. And in recent months, I've started my day here. I come in to the church and before I open my office or before I get down to work, I sit usually in the back view, kind of where Yvonne's sitting right now. And I might just spend a couple of minutes, two, three, four, maybe five, praying. And it's a wonderful feeling because this place has become the center, at least for almost now, what, two decades of my life with God. And I imagine that you can hardly imagine your life with God without this place as well. Do you love this sacred space? Do you long to come to this holy place? Now some of you, and I'm not going to name names, some of you were around maybe when this place was dedicated, when this sanctuary was first opened for worship. And some of you have been here for baptisms, for marriages, and for funerals. Funerals of spouses, funerals for a child, funerals for a brother, as I looked around the room. And we might be coming to church these days with a bitter suitcase in our mouth, because boy, the good old days, those are sure long gone. And why is it that so many churches these days are close to empty. And what does the future hold for churches like our saviors? Well, it's hard to imagine life without the church. It's hard to imagine life with God apart from this holy place. So again, I ask you, what does our faith truly need to survive? When all else is said and done, when everything else is swept away, when literally the bottom falls out of our world, what do we have to cling to? What does our faith have to grasp and to hold on to? Well, centuries ago, Martin Luther had this to say, the soul can do without everything except the Word of God. The soul can do without everything except the Word of God. So can we say the same? Can our faith survive with nothing else to feed it except Christ and His Word? Well, it's time for me now to turn to our Gospel lesson and my sermon text for today. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords, and he drove from the temple area both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? And his disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you give us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days. And the Jews replied, This temple has taken 46 years to build, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. We well, can only imagine, as shocking as it would be to learn that your church is going to be turned into a brewery and a restaurant, imagine how shocking it would be to be told that your, that your church was about to be demolished, that your church was about to be destroyed. For over a thousand years, God's people had worshipped at the temple. 
in good times and in bad. But the temple had been destroyed once before because of the sin of its people. And it took a century almost before it was rebuilt. And it was a, it was a shell of its former glory in the days of Solomon. But by the time of Jesus and the Herods arrived on the scene, they were building a truly magnificent structure. Can you imagine? 46 years had been spent building that, what sometimes is called the second temple. And within a generation of Jesus' time here on earth, that temple would be demolished until not one stone was left upon another. And it broke Jesus' heart. But it also, Jesus, as he reminded his followers and anyone who was willing to listen, God was doing a new thing in their day and age. And it was downright breathtaking to behold. It was truly shocking. It was more shocking than a brewery in a chancel. And an almost unbelievable sign would be given to the world. And what sign would that be? It would be God nailed to a cross and then followed by a God who is resurrected from a borrowed tomb. We see the stage set for this already in John chapter 1. You see, John from the very outset of his telling of the gospel sets the stage for all that will follow. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made, and in Him was life, and that life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own, which his, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh, and He tabernacled among us. We've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Because the church, the Christian, the believer these days, we don't actually need a sanctuary. We don't actually need a cathedral. We actually can do without stained glass. We don't need an organ. We don't need a pulpit. We don't need pews for our faith to survive. Or at least, I hope we know that that's the case. Because Christ is our new temple. And whenever we gather in His name and hear His word and receive His meal, we're standing. We're gathered on holy ground. So what about us? As we look to the future, which can be hard to imagine these days, in the end, what does our faith need to survive? Can it survive the loss of this building? Could it survive the loss of our church? And I want to speak to those of you now, especially, who are worshiping at home and have been doing so for a few years. And I know how much many of you miss coming to church, how you give almost anything to be able to be with us in person. But by the grace of God, your faith has somehow survived. And you've clung to Christ. And today, do we need to hear His promise? I do. I know I do. And I imagine you might as well. Christ again comes to us this morning and He says, Nothing, nothing can snatch you from My hand. And absolutely nothing can take you from My Father's grasp. The last weekend, Saturday afternoon, I went to visit Nancy Kino. Nancy hasn't been able to be with us in church for most of the last two years because of her declining health. So the church, we had to go to her to bring her the word of her Lord and to bring her this holy meal. 
But Nancy, last Saturday, she was heavily sedated. She was no longer receiving life-saving treatment. She had entered comfort care. So I sat down at her bedside knowing that that could have been the last time that I would see her, that that end was that close at hand. So I sat down at her bedside and I read to her. I read to her from Hebrews chapter 11. I also shared with her Psalm 71. But I want to share with you two other passages that I read to her, and I did not mention these on Friday at her funeral. I read to her the first few verses of the last two chapters of the holy book. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with man, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more mourning, no more death, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That's exactly what Christ came to do. And it began there where the Word was made flesh. And it continued when Jesus went into the temple and said, You don't need this place anymore. All you need is me. And I shared these words as well with Nancy about 24 hours before her last breath. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city, and on each side of the river stood the tree of life, yielding its twelve crops of fruit, its fruit every month being produced. And the leaves of those trees are for the healing of the nation, and no longer will there be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him, and they will see him face to face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Now I have a word, a last word of the Lord to share with you, which is sandwiched between those verses that I read to Nancy. We're given a depiction of what is to come. When we get to heaven, there's going to be no, no out of this world cathedral. There's going to be no, no magnificent basilica for us to worship in. We won't need a holy place anymore. We won't need a sacred space anymore. All we need is Him. God gives us this vision. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city didn't need the sun, and it didn't need the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. And the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. The Lord is now our temple, and wherever two or three or twenty gather in his name, we're standing on holy ground. And he comes to us with his comfort and his aid, with his peace and his pardon. And it will always be that way until he returns. Amen.
We have heard the word of the Lord and what it means for our lives. So I invite you to rise and join with me in confessing our faith. We do so using the Apostles' Creed. We confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we continue with the prayer of the church, we have one name to add to our prayers today. We'll be adding Liz Webster, who's facing surgery here at the end of the month. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. I invite you to kneel if you're able. Direct your holy church and the communion of saints around the world. By the power of your Holy Spirit, keep us steadfast in your word and in the one true life unto li one true faith unto life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy. Let the gospel of repentance and forgiveness be preached to the ends of the earth. Help us to be witnesses to your Son's unfailing love. Lord, in your mercy. Fill us with your spirit so that we may live out our faith in our daily vocations. Lord, in your mercy. Incline your ears to the oppressed and the vulnerable, to refugees, to victims of injustice. Lord, in your mercy. Rule the nations according to your good and perfect will. Humble all who serve in positions of, a pow of power, reminding them that they are accountable to you. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort our brothers and sisters in Christ who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, including Paula, Melody, Gail, Pam, Brian, Pat, Dane, Kathy, Don, Carol, Jolene, Dennis, Liz, Marie, Rochelle, Larry, and Angela. Lord, in your mercy. Continue the good work you have begun in us through Jesus Christ, your Son. We pray this for all the baptized, including Benjamin, Addison, Aiden, Noah, and Michaela. Lord, in your mercy. God of grace, hear the cries of all who call to you. Lord, in your mercy. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We continue our service with the gathering of the offering.
the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our seal in faith and life and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the same way also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them to drink, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
Now may the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true Christian faith unto life everlasting. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive the benediction of your Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. I invite forward those who will be bringing the sacrament to the sick and homebound. Let us pray. Eternal God, whose glory is revealed in the crucified and risen Lord, bless those who go forth to share your word and sacrament with our sisters and brothers who are sick or homebound. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those to whom we bring this communion in the body and blood of your Son, that we may all feast upon your abundant love made known in Jesus Christ our Lord. Go in peace as you serve the Lord.
one announcement or reminder before we conclude our service. That is, and if you need to, write it down. Write it on your bulletin before you leave. Next Sunday, we begin daylight savings time. You know what that means, Saturday before you go to bed. You need to turn your clocks ahead or you'll be worshiping in Spanish. Because if you comment that we think is 9.15, but we'll be done with service. So make sure you change your clocks next Saturday night before you go to bed. You've been warned. You've been told. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Yeah, her birthday yesterday. So let's give Rick Megan and Sabine have to do it loud enough so they can hear us. I think Grandma has her somewhere down the hall. So welcome back, Megan, and happy birthday. We'll get those flowers to you on your way. Out.